Welcome to Community Crossfire, another point of view. I'm your host, Norman Norman Oliver. Yes, the show has been on fire. You know, and you know, it's crazy, right? It's been going crazy on Facebook and people are doing a lot of talking. The bottom line is, first of all, this is what I said. See, a lot of people in our community get things misconstrued. I hope I didn't kill the English language, right? What I said was I'm for the marches. But if we get five black kids between the ages of 15 and 10 get shot on a city park, why aren't we marching for that? So also what I said, and I won't mention names, some of these guys right now on Facebook are the new leaders in our community. And I think that we should challenge you. You know, you had guys, and I think Tony and I, I'm going to the president of Delaware State in a minute. So leadership passed down, right? Jim Gilliam Sr. Jr., right? You have guys like Herman Holloway, Al Plant Sr., you had, you know, you had um, Skinny Wilson. You had guys like us in the new leadership. Now we're trying to pass it down. So we're not going to challenge you. It's not going to happen. I'm going to challenge you. And don't call Ivan. Don't call Ivan all kinds of sellouts and Uncle Tom's because of DVT. I'm the one saying it. Say it about me. And also, I'm going to tell you this right here. Now that I'm on fire, right? And, and Ty said, no, I'm, don't get, no, I'm going to be on fire, right? Another thing, right? A person has a right to run for whatever they want to run for. But guess what? We have a right to vote for whoever the hell we want to vote for, too. So you can't tell us what to do. We won't tell you what to do. So we have a clear cut. Now let me tell you something else about, about this, this Facebook stuff, right? You got a lot of blacks in our community talking to each other, right? Then you have a person, Tony, like my niece, runs for office. 85% of her votes came from the white community. Where were all those black people singing Kumbaya? Don't talk to me about that. I'm a, I'm, look, look, look. How you doing, Doc? You're on fire today, as you Oh, so, sorry, man. Sorry for bringing Sorry, brother. I'm so honored, right? We have Dr. Tony Allen, the president of Delaware State University. We have County Executive Matt Myers, and we have um, State Senator Tizzy Lockman joining me today. But first, Dr. Allen, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great, brother. Always a pleasure to be with you, man. And let me ask you a question. How did you get there? How did you, how did you get to Delaware State? You know, I've been chasing Delaware State for a decade and a half. Uh, so I applied uh, to be the president many years ago and I uh, made the finals, uh, but I think they chose the right man at the time. Dr. Williams turned out to be a very good friend of mine. And then as I was going through my career at Bank of America, it was really my mother who kept saying, you know, you need to be an educator. Wow. Well, tell, tell us how you first started. I mean, when, before you even got to this, you had several other jobs. Oh, right? sure, sure. My, my, uh, Real start was uh, at the University of Delaware staging a sit-in. Wow. That's what happened. Uh, we were fighting for student rights. particularly. You actually staged a sit-in at University of Delaware? Yeah, we closed down the, the university. I never do that. Yep, yep. And that, that, got, that got me passionate because before that I was just kind of an apathetic political science right. major. But then I started working at Lincoln University in the summers. At the I told her before you go any further. Mm -hmm. But why did, why did you sit in? What, what, what happened? I, uh, it's a funny story. I was dropping off two of my classmates right. in the west part of campus, and I lived on the north part of campus. When I turned around to go to the north campus, they said I was driving suspiciously. I told them I was a student at the university. They didn't believe me. Get out of here. Like a, a, like a white security cop? Yep. Or spend a night wow. in jail. Get out of here. Yep. You spend a night in jail? Yep. Then the next, next two days, Never we knew. started planning, and we said we're not going to take this. There had been a lot of unrest generally, and we said we need to stand up for ourselves. And... Uh, so I was kind of at the center of it. Wow. Uh, but it changed me. It changed me. It had me thinking about who I am and what my responsibility is to my people. And that kind of that kind of started my whole life. Never service. ever heard that story. Yeah. How was it? I'm, I'm going to stay here for one sure. second. How was it being, I guess it was probably 90% whites and 10% at University of Delaware? We used to call ourselves the three percenters. I was 3%? Yep. So how was it then? It was tough. You, know, you, you could literally walk campus all day and not see another uh, person who looked like you. People thought you were there for reasons around quotas and all those kinds of things. It was tough. But what was interesting about it is the black people, uh, the black students that were there, we bonded together and, wow. uh, and, stayed, and have stayed together since. So it just really taught us a lot about how important we are to one another. Sometimes uh -huh. we as black people don't understand how important we are to right. one another and how we need to take care of each other, which is why I'm completely honored to be a Delaware student. I never knew that story. Thank you. You can move on now. Thanks for that. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Okay, then... What oh, then I graduated, thought I wanted to be a lawyer. You were involved in this, actually. I was uh, interning at Skadden Arps. Mm -hmm. uh, I met a young lawyer then, uh, Matt Den, 
Wow. We got formed a relationship. He said, you don't seem like you really want to be a, an attorney. I said, it's not really what I'm passionate about. He said, go do what you love. Law school will always be there. I called you that day. Uh-huh. Two days later, you got me a job at Edgemore Community Center. Right. I worked there as a substance abuse prevention coordinator, mm-hmm. worked at the children's home as a residential counselor, turned that into a partnership with a good friend of mine, Suzanne Cisco. We started Public Allies, wow. which is still up and running today. Did that for a couple of years, went to grad school in New York, uh, came back. So you went to grad school at the Public Allies? I did. I did. Okay. Yeah. Because I thought you went straight to Urban League. No, no. That's an interesting story, too. When I came back, uh, I worked for for, uh, then Senator Biden. And I told him I need to work full time, but I also want to go to school full time. How did you get that job? You know what? It was really a mutual friend. Actually, David Sisko, Suzanne's um, father. Uh, knew a guy named Bert D. Clemente, who was the state I know Bert. I the remember time. Bert. And that's yeah. how that connection. Uh, He's passed away recently, too, right? Yeah. yeah. Good guy. Yeah. So, you know what? I, again, I, I keep cutting you up because sure. some of this stuff I never knew. Sure. I thought Jim Gilliam Jr. got you the job with Joe Biden. No, but Jim Gilliam Sr. is very involved in my I mean, Jr. Process. I know what you're talking about. I knew, I knew Jim Gilliam Jr. from Public Allies. In okay. fact, uh, he was a little bit of a mentor for me while I was in uh, New York. Okay. So, but when I came back, I worked for him, him, then Senator Biden, as a speechwriter and special assistant. That's how I got to know. Um, I was a Newcastle kid, but that's how I moved to Wilmington, got really connected with Wilmington politics and urban affairs. And I was getting my doctorate in urban affairs and public hmm. policy while I was working for him. And the last thing then Senator Biden said to me was, I want you to spend a year with this friend of mine, Jim Gilliam Sr., because he's trying to start the Urban League in Wilmington. Wow. So he loaned me out. Loaned me out to, I call him Senator Captain. Biden loaned you out. Yep. I call him Captain Jim Gilliam. Right, right, right. He loaned me out to Captain for a year, changed my life. That man became my best friend, also uh, made me the founding president of the Urban League. So um, you're the founding member in the state of Delaware? Yeah, Jim, Jim is the founder. I'm the founding president. Wow. Yep. Spent about four years there or so. And I uh, thought I wanted to wanted, uh, get involved in politics like, like you for a little bit. Uh, but I said I need to make a little money first. But you made a lot of money. Well, I made a little money. You made a lot of money. <laughs> anyway, Jim you, was... You're still counting your money. Jim was still in that. He's like, I want to talk about that. Nah, yeah, okay. Jim, but Jim was still in that. He hook, hooked me up with then MBNA, um, created an opportunity, opportunity for me there, and then I spent... What did you do at MBNA? Well, you know, I was really in communications and corporate affairs throughout both MBNA and Bank of America. So were you writing some of the international stuff, too? Yeah, I did a lot, at, particularly at the end, the Bank of America part. I was the, I developed their discipline. We call it corporate reputation uh-huh. uh, because we were coming out of the financial crisis and need to get our reputation back up. So, Would you say writing's a passion? Oh, oh, that's what I love more than most things. Wow. But, say for Tara. I'm going to say for Tara. I understand yeah. that. Yeah. So how did you develop that passion of just writing? Because I, I read some of your stuff and it's, it's always profound. Uh, you know, Norma, it's how I express myself. Uh-huh. Uh, normally, I'm a pretty even-tempered person, but uh-huh. when I feel like I need to say something, for me, it's best expressed through, through writing. Right. Yeah. So, so you get to, after the MBA now, uh-huh. I'm Bank of Del- then you get to Delaware State, you're provost. Is that? Uh-huh. Yeah, so Harry Williams, Dr. Right? Williams, uh-huh. Uh, come to Harry, I say, Harry, I think I still want to be a college president. Remember, I tried to do it 10 years earlier. Yeah, right. He said, you could be a college president, but you're not going to get the job right now. What's going to happen is they're going to, they're going to put you in the finals and, or any interview. So I interviewed at a couple of places. They put me in the finals. I remember. And uh, he said, what you need to do is try to get to the highest level possible at a university, not going to be the president, and then see what happens. How about you come uh, to Delaware State as provost? He said, you got to be able to get through it, interview, compete. But if you get the job, I'll tell you it'll change your life. And Harry Williams was right. Wow. Changed my life. Wow. What's your vision for Delaware State University? You've heard me talk about it. Uh, we want to be the most substantively diverse, contemporary, unapologetically black university in the country. And I say those things uh, in three specific ways. You know, you sure you know this because you're a grad, but when I talk about diverse, think about this 104 offerings, uh, 1.2 million square feet, a world-class aviation program, an early college high school, Hmm. A research comprehensive university. We wow. want to make sure that everybody knows that. Contemporary is making sure we're teaching real world skills to our students. And unapolog- unapologetically black just means that we are an HBCU. That's not changing. Let me, well, how, how can someone 
can fuse. It's diverse. You just said, you know, you got yeah. people from China, you got people white, you got black. It's diverse, right? So how do they get that confused with you trying to get rid of the HBCU? I think it's asinine. On no, well, look, we're not trying to get rid of. Uh, the I HBCU know you're not, staff. but why? But you, you understand what I'm saying? And and I see because I know you, and and I know your passion, yeah. and and how you work with black folks. Yeah. Did I piss you off when when yeah. somebody questioned? No, that? no, no. I know so, where. It's, so I just get pissed. I probably okay. I know where. I get pissed for you. I know where. It's I tell them go to hell. I know where. It's Can you coming say that from. on TV? I know where it's okay, coming I'm sorry. from. Sorry, I know where it's coming from. People want to feel like black institutions are, are are ours. I get it. And the truth is, it is ours. We are still very much first generation African American, right? right? But the truth is, we've opened up new opportunities. Think about our dreamers, children of undocumented workers. We have more dreamers that choose Delaware State than any other place. How is that working with um, the presidents, uh, with the undocumented? How, how, how do you make that work? We make it work because we have uh, this, this organization called the Dream.us, and they make it happen for us. They, they give them full scholarships, room, board, and tuition, and then we wrap our arms around them. And when I say we, I do mean we. I just don't mean the staff or the leadership. The students, the this black is, students, this is good stuff, wrap said. themselves around the dreamers. Hmm. Uh, you know why? Because when we started in 1891, underserved, locked out of the higher education system, right? Right. Right. So now all we are doing is making sure that in 2020, we're doing the same thing consistent with our mission for 130 years. So you're consistent with your mission. Yeah. And you get people who think that you. And by the way. You got me hot in here. No, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the plan. So, by the way, I served on the board with Alan Sessoms, and your vision is like night and day is Alan Sessoms. I see. What is, uh, well, you know, all presidents do, do it differently, in my view, right? And they build on, build on one another. I go back to Jerome Holland, who in some ways saved the university at a very critical time. And then you think about Luna Mashu and all the years he was there. I love Luna Mashu. Yeah, and, and, you know, I'm glad he mentioned this, ladies and gentlemen. This is my opinion, right? Not his. This is my opinion. I think he's going to be the greatest president in the history of Delaware State. I just hope we're able to keep him. And let me... Uh, well, no, I'm not going... First, I'm no, not going no, anywhere. That's not you I'm saying not it. That's me. Can I, can I do the, conduct an interview? Yes. Or do you want to, <laughs> yes. you want to switch seats? Do you want to sit over... No, I do not want to switch seats. I do not want okay. to switch seats. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Why did you acquire um, Wesley? Wesley. Mm -hmm. Oh, because it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Right? That seems right? brilliant, by the way. Look, let me tell you. 20 buildings, 50 acres, right in downtown Dover. Wow. The population, the student population, looks very similar to ours. You know, we're at HBCU. Wesley's a minority serving institution. Oh, for real? Yeah, so their, their student demographic profile looks very similar to ours. So I always say, does it go back to our mission? The truth is, they were once a very different looking school. Now they look much more like us. So I've watched their struggles for a couple of years, and I said, if the moment is right, us, we're going to take full advantage of that because that's what it means to be substantively diverse, contemporary, and unapologetically black. And you know what's funny? Uh, a person said to me, he said, you know, Norm, there's a reason why Sears, J.C. Penney's, and those guys weren't like that because they wouldn't change. Then you get Walmart, right? You get Amazon. The world is changing, you know, and you're changing, right? You're like, okay, we have Dover State University, right? I have an opportunity to acquire a, a major institution right down the street from me, and you took advantage of it. Well, it's the first time an HBCU has actually acquired a non- The uh, very HBCU. first time? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. wow. But that's not why we do it. It was a good value proposition for us. Their estimated value, so take Wesley all in, is about $34 million. They have debt of around a little under 15. So it's a good value buy, and it's close connected to our mission. They are the students that we serve. Plus, there are very interesting programs that match ours. I bet you, after this is over, our College of Health and Behavioral Sciences at Delaware State. Right. And their programs in those same services, think of nursing, occupational therapy, will make our new college uh, one of the best in the region, if not the country. So right. I just feel like there is enormous opportunity uh, by making this acquisition, which is why we're very focused. I, 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 Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you're enjoying this interview. I'm really enjoying it. I'm going over a little bit of time because this is so freaking interesting. Let me ask you a couple more questions. I know you have to go, but this is good. And I know people, the MEAC, a lot, a lot of yeah. schools, right, have left the MEAC and Delaware State University is still standing. Do you see us moving? If not, why? If so, why? Well, remember, we founded the MEAC. What I mean by that is Luna Mashu I got that. founded the MEAC. Um, so we're not going to be the ones um, that breaks it down. But you're not. 
Well, stay with me. Okay. Stay with me. Today, uh, the president of the MEAC is Dr. Charlie Wilson. Charlie Wilson is a professor at Delaware State University. Okay. All right. So we have a lot of vested interest in it. What, what I can tell you is our ability to strengthen the MEAC uh, is where we're focused now. And as we do that, we're making sure that we're thinking globally about where Delaware State wants to be overall. I don't know what the hell you just said, but it sound, sound convincing. What do you mean? You, you want to strengthen the MEAC. You go to the MEAC tournaments, right? You want to have a strong MEAC. But it's nobody left. You got Hampton left. You got North no, Carolina. That's not true. They're, they're, is, is, who's Morgan, left? Morgan is left. South Carolina State is left. Howard is still hanging. As a matter of fact. Hanging. Like you said, hanging. Ha no, we Hanging. Have, we have substantive world-class HBCUs. In There's the about three of you guys left. That okay. is not true. Let me ask you another question. Before you, before you go, tell, tell everybody what's going on with Homecoming. What is Homecoming with this COVID? Homecoming is the third weekend of April. I think it's April 21st. So, so everything, what do you think is going to be a football season then? Do you think everything is going to be pushed back? or will it Well, be you know, that we know in, in the MEAC we've suspended, and that's suspended is an important word, suspended fall sports. So we're looking at COVID very closely, as you might imagine. Uh, but our view is if there's an opportunity to have fall sports in the spring, that's exactly what we'll do. If that's not able to occur, we'll at least have our spring game on homecoming weekend. So you'll still get a very good feel of the oh, Delaware State Oh, got you, spring game. game. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed this. This was pretty cool, man. I, I like interviewing you. You didn't I, let me you, say everything I needed to say. You said a lot. You said too much. I was great. You said, <laughs> you said no. So well, let me. Can I talk about you just a second? No. So, well, I'm so going, let, let me talk about you for a second. Break. No. 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 <laughs> so you know, I was going to say, it's going to be interesting how. And we do got a lot to talk about, right? How you incorporate the sports from Wesley and Delaware State. That's a whole nother conversation, right? That is. Because that Wesley is. has a pretty successful football team, A very team, good right? one. A very good so, one. So will we be, will they be, their players and their coach, everybody move over to us? We, we, don't, we don't know all of that. We don't know how the configuration is going to go just yet. But let me say this to you, Norman. I want to say this to you. I have watched you uh, for a long time as a mentor, brother, and friend. And I love what you're doing. You are, in many ways, the renaissance man uh, of Wilmington. And I say that in all candor. What I think you're doing is setting the standard for a lot of folks, uh, particularly as a Delaware, Delaware State alum, to follow. So I just want to thank you uh, for what you've meant to your university, your alma mater, and first per person what you've meant to me. Thank you. And I would cry, but I know you owe me a bottle of wine. So, And I know you don't drink. Okay, thank Psych. You. Thank you. But I do. <laughs> and I'm going to drink me some cognac and wine on this guy. We're going to take a break. And Matt Myers, since he's late, he'll be coming in next. Come on in, Matt. Welcome back to Community Calls, Find Another Point of View. I'm your host, Stormy Norman. I hope you enjoyed the first segment with Dr. Tony Allen, I thought it was a very interesting conversation. This um, segment, we have two people on. I mean, now they want to double team me. You know, they're like, now nah, see, you can't fight along like bang. So we got County Executive Matt Myers and we have Senator Tizzy Lockman. But before I go to them, I have something I have to say, right? First of all, let me say this. Unconditionally, I support Mayor Mike Bazicki, right? I think that he's done an incredible job, you know, and I know that there's race conversation, but Hell, the guys put like four or five million dollars in black students going to college. Then there's another conversation about Pertini Poland. Why? I don't make me understand this, right? These guys come out of college, right? They grew up in this community. They built a business. The business becomes successful. What are we that? That's a problem. Like, I'm an entrepreneur now, right? And I wish, I hope and pray that I have those kind of successes. Um, I'm not on Facebook, but every once in a while people say, and I know this is going to piss some people off. Good. I want to piss you off, right? What you should try to do, and by the way, what's amazing to me is some of the people who are criticizing, they have businesses. Mm. Know what it means to me? Like, let me see. How can I get these guys on my side? Like, I'm, I mean... I got a degree from Dover State, so maybe I may not be the smartest person. But I want to learn from people who are successful. Am I supporting uh, Mike Pazicki? Yes. Am I supporting Matt Marsh? Yes. 
Am I supporting Tizzy Lockman? Yes. So please just get it. And, and again, what happens? Seriously, right? What happens? You get these four or five people. They talk to each other. Then they got 20 people talking, and they think everybody's listening. In the meantime, you've served 400,000 people, 500,000 people. 560,000. How many people are you serve in your district? About 42,000. 42,000. So you got 20 people talking, and they think everybody's listening. Can I say something about that, Norm? Please do. Jump in. I, I grew up here, and then I went away to college. When I was in college, I had this incredible opportunity to go to Africa. And I went and I ended up living in Kenya for a year. And it was amazing to me in Kenya that, to me, everybody looked very similar. Almost everyone in the country is black, right? Mm -hmm. But when you talk to Kenyans, they're like, oh, he's a Kikuyu. He's a Luo. He's a Maasai. He's like, there are all these different tribes. And you find that, actually, when you get down to it, a lot of them can't stand each other. Right. And then you think about it more, you're like, this country is not a very wealthy country. It's a pretty poor country. How, did you, how did you get to Kenya? I went there initially studying abroad, and then I got a grant to go and start a, a sand making company there in a, in a poor community. Wow. But one thing that you find is that all, like, because of tribal issues, everybody hates each other. And because everybody hates each other, the country is not realizing its full potential. I think and then years later, I went to Iraq as a diplomat. And Iraq, Iraq has literally, you put your finger in the ground, oil is going to pop up, right. right? They have wealth, that they're incredible wealth. The whole world wants that kind of energy. But the problem is the Sunni, the Shia, the Kurd, they all hate each other. So, and and it, it suppresses it. And I get so concerned when I come here in my hometown of Wilmington, and you see these divisions, and you understand that whether we realize it or not, it's hurting all of us. So why do you think, and, and Tissy wants to jump in on this yeah, conversation. Yeah, I do. So, so, so why, why do you? See, I was over in Gambia too, right? I'm in South Africa mm -hmm. and all, and Morocco. I do mm -hmm. African stuff myself, so I get it. And that's why I read the book Willie Lynch mm -hmm. because I think it's a way that we all pull from each other. And I don't want to get you too deep into that conversation because this is my conversation. But it sounds like you're saying the same thing. It's, it's divisions. Yeah. And Tizzy, you want to jump well, in? Well, yeah, I just I did. I mean, I think you've both made really interesting points about some of the different forms of unrest that we see bubbling up in our community and that tribalism that seems to be on the rise, I, I think. Um, but I think it is important to to hear criticisms and to to really dig into where they're they're coming from because mm -hmm. I think we do have different groups of people in our community. We have a very diverse city. We have a very diverse county and state. Um, and we're not all always going to agree on things. We're not all going to align behind the same people. Um, but I think where the tribalism comes in is when we really, you know, blindly oppose one another because so-and-so is one of us and so-and-so isn't one of us or whatever comes with that. I, I think I really value, you know, just as a human being and certainly as a legislator, you know, validating why someone might disagree with me um, or someone I support Tizzy, and, and go after but, them. But that's interesting because you you give me the impression like you, you you a person like, why can't we all just get along, right? Definitely. And, and so, so when you get the criticism for whatever reason, mm -hmm. maybe because of your educational policies, mm -hmm. um, how do you handle it? Oh, I mean, it's hard because we are human beings. And when someone, you, you have a very clear idea in your mind of what is the right thing to do. And I have the experience and the education and I must be right. And right. any criticism is like an attack, right? You right. just kind of feel really defensive. Um, I, I think you just have to create space to reflect on your own motivations and, and your own experience. I think I consider myself a progressive. We uh -huh. have a lot of conversations, um, you know, as progressives. And, and I'm a progressive who comes from a relative amount of like, privilege, I think, and good education. But I had this amazing experience as an organizer working with the Christina Cultural Arts Center, right. helping folks from, from communities that were not communities I grew up in navigate educational policy and the educational space. And I came to realize that I had ideas in, in policy that I thought would best serve those folks in those right. neighborhoods. And then when I talk to folks in those neighborhoods, I might find out that they have different ideas and opinions. And it's important to be able to step back and say, I don't know everything. Let me, do you get a lot from folks, what about Margaret Rose Henry mm. or Herman Sr. Mm -hmm. or people before you? Do you find yourself being compared to that or you don't? Even your, your father has strong opinions. Oh, well, that was his whole job. Right, right. <laughs> so do you get that kind of stuff too? Sure. I mean, I think we, we certainly are spiritual descendants of them and I hope that I can really deserve to be compared spiritual to the, descendants wow that's, 
<laughs> this is getting serious. <laughs> you know, well, I mean, no, I Senator him. Brown and I are the, the third and fourth, yeah. you know, black senators. And right. so we are, have a very close alignment with them. I hope we can um, deserve to be really compared to them. Like last week, we were all there for the dedication of the new bridge. Yes. Um, and everyone talked about Senator Henry and what a bridge builder sh she has always been in her right. career. I hope that that's true for myself as well. I look to, to that and I, I see you know, a lot of inspiration in that work that she represents. I mean, she crossed parties and, right. and all those types of things. So well, she was a so Republican. So. She was a Republican in the beginning. I mean, politics. Yeah. But um, so, <laughs> so I think I, I hope that I hope so. And I think, you know, not only do I hope that I can live up to that reputation, I think we also have this responsibility um, moving into the future with all these different contexts to like push differently and push harder. And it's, you know, we build bridges, but we also challenge ourselves and our our peers to to maybe not always be as patient and right. as um as easygoing in the face of of what oppression discrimination things well, like that that we see well said Matt, i'm gonna ask you a similar question right because you came after a strong personality in tom gordon <laughs> and um i know you've had some issues even with marvellous and those guys the unions because a lot of people still like tom how have you been able to transition? You know, I guess I guess it was difficult, right? I mean, you and I talked, but mm -hmm. we we never talked about this. Um, um, how you understand where I'm going? Yeah, I understand. L listen to to me and to my team at the county. It's about the issues and serving the people of the county. A lot of times, as you know, kind of behind closed doors, you're doing work, and it gets very personal very fast. I may disagree with Mr. Maravellis or, or with a one union or another. About I just bunch I'm Jimmy up. Because right, just I'm anyone there. about what's the best way to encourage apprenticeship. We have a big problem, a job training problem in our community, right? And there are a lot of ways we can encourage job training. You might think there's one way to do it that's absolutely the best way. And Senator Lockman might think there's a different way. And I might think there's a third way. What we're really trying to do is make sure there's some level of respect that we disagree. You, sometimes you're going to get your way. Sometimes uh, Senator Lockman's going to, sometimes I'm going to get my way. Sometimes it's going to be some compromise or none of us are going to get what we want. But the, what surprises me as a first term, ele first time elected official like mm -hmm. Senator Lockman is that I think too often it gets so personal. It's personal. It's like, you're corrupt and you're, no, you're not corrupt. We just disagree. Right. We just disagree. And they take it to another level. That's right. And and this time, someone's going to win or lose or there's going to be a compromise, and then we'll, we'll work together next time. Speaking of winning and losing, right, it seems to me that you were magnificent in the way you maneuvered and got $300, $400, $500 million, whatever, stimulus money, right? <laughs> then the next thing I know, I look up and the attorney general wants to sue you. <laughs> the governor wants to take money from you. Uh, you're like, man, I just freaking out thought everybody, right? So where are you at with that right there? And so, how much money do you have? So, so the state as a whole, the state of Delaware, uh, got $1.25 billion from the federal government under gotcha. the CARES Act passed uh, back in, in uh, March. Um, $1.25 billion for the whole state of Delaware. Any municipality or county in the country, there are about 177 of us with more than 500,000 people, could get... Uh, a, an amount out of that state amount from the federal government. So we just wrote the federal government like 176 other jurisdictions did across the country, and we were given 322.8 billion. Wow. Million. So do the governor, state, does, do they look at it as if you took some money from their 2.4 billion? I I think so. Now, because we took the amount, the state Dover. Ladies the, and gentlemen, I hope you listen to this. This is good. This is education. Go ahead. The state government got 927 million. Right. Got you. We got Newcastle County. We're the only other government in the state other than uh, the state government to get a direct direct money from the feds. The state got nine hundred twenty seven million. We got three hundred twenty two point eight million. And now we've been using it, obviously, on these testing sites. Right. And go get tested. Go to nccde.org slash covid19. There are two testing sites every day all around the county. You should sign up ahead of time. Even if you don't, you can just show up. But you also hold this and that make it seem like it's all sugars and coffee, <laughs> right? Because you also got criticized because you were going to give some firefighters all $10,000. Am I right? What we wanted to do... I, my, now, what does that have to do with COVID? So my belief, based on uh, partially my experience as a diplomat in Iraq, the first thing you do <laughs> in crisis... <laughs> 
the first thing you do in crisis, right, is you got to make sure the people on the front lines, whether they're doctors, nurses, working in supermarkets, people. Well, we're educators, but uh, well, if you're putting yourselves in harm's way, right? A lot of educators, mm-hmm. uh, and I'm not gonna. I'm not. I, I was. Not, I spent four years as a teacher. I want to see you right? get out of this one, we'll right? <laughs> no, I spent four years as a teacher. We had paramedics. Matt, the, Matt, the, you were gonna give. On. You were gonna give every firefighter. No, ten thousand dollars. That sounds like. Hey man, I need you. The night. The night. Uh, the night the county council uh, decided not to go forward with our proposal for $10,000 hazard pay for those who put themselves in harm's way because of COVID. There were four calls. Just during the time county council was debating this thing, there were four COVID-19 related calls, which means that while most of society was quarantined, sitting at home, right, keeping safe, right. we were sending loved ones out, right, to people's homes, to people's mm-hmm. workplaces, to, to save people with this contagious, invisible virus. And to do that, I believe people do deserve extra compensation. Matt, I'm not disagreeing with you. Man. Right. But to make it sound like to intelligent people that out of the goodness of my heart, I'm going to give every firefighter $10,000. Guess what? The people buying Domino's Pizza were out there in COVID. Delivering, why didn't you give them all $10,000? Because mm-hmm. Domino's should do that. Because uh, where- well, well, why because the employer, give it to them? because because and, I, they're, right, they're, if you're a job, Domino's that's driver, their, dude, if you're that's not the, a, that if, if I'm in charge job. of Domino's, if I'm in charge of Domino's, I increase the price by that fifty cents. That is the firefighter's job to be there. Like, yeah, but like it's but the Domino's. But they're, 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 Am I right? Do you agree with me? Do you agree with him? I think it's a tough. I, I think I think the government has a responsibility to make sure that all workers are are cared for during a crisis. Absolutely. It's not, but it's could like you? Corporations um, do as well. But this is also a situation. But do you see how that could look? You say it's their yes. job, but this yeah. is a situation. I'm not. By the way, I don't want a firefighter calling me saying I was against him. I'm for him. <laughs> but. but but this argument seems to me to be a little... But it's serious. also a situation where I understand it. it's not just them. Th- listen, firefighters, police officers, paramedics, all the time, their job, what they signed up to do is put themselves in harm's way. But with this invisible virus, what they were doing, certainly at the time, and we know for sure now, they were not just putting themselves in harm's way. They were putting their anyone they lived with in harm's way, Matt, their parents in harm's way, their grandparents in, in harm's Black way. Black Lives Matter is putting their lives in harm's But they're volunteering why did, why to do did, it. Why didn't you give everybody walking into Black Lives Matter $10,000? Because they, because uh, first of all, it's Yeah. Not, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah. I was out there. What? I'm Wait, just, I was out there. I was, I was out a there. self-interest, no, too. Because, <laughs> because, because you can understand that looks political, right? You do agree with me on that. Can we agree that, on one thing? That what looks political? If you give every freaking firefighter $10,000. It wasn't giving every firefighter $10,000. It was saying anyone that put themselves in harm's way. But I just told performing you. Performing a public service, right? Who is a public employee. Would who, you do that? Well, why job. don't we talk about the other processes in place to, to look at how some of the other funds, aside from the 10000 um, per firefighter Let's talk about might it. be expended. Because I did, I did, Matt asked me, and I agreed to serve as a chair of a, a subgroup of a committee that's focused on um, identifying priorities for spending some of the, that CARES Act money way, on vulnerable populations, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I agreed to do it, uh, not without, you know, getting any flack for that, because you do know how to start fires out there sometimes. So what would, you, what would you do? Do you agree? This is a yes or no. Since you want to jump in the conversation. I do. Would, do you agree to give all the firefighters $10,000? You, I have to give a yes or no. I would say, I would say, uh, what, 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 what? no in a qualified sense that I believe in processes. And what I was gonna wanted to talk about was the process put in place uh, that our committee is undergoing, which is a fair, stakeholder-driven process to identify how do we spend that money. That doesn't mean no, I don't want to give the firefighters money, but I think it's great when you're spending these sort of federal windfall to address the the crisis to be able to think through methodically. How do we prioritize spending that money? And I think that's exactly what we're doing with these committees. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily that you should not have done that. I, I don't really <laughs> want to say yes or no on, on that. But, well, I, but I prefer a process in which we are able as the process? public to weigh in process on the for expenditure. What? Did the council ultimately approve that? No, it wasn't even considered, right. ultimately. Right. There's all sorts of politics. I mean, but they would have had to. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Crossfire, and that's what we do on Crossfire. We, yeah. we get it in. So to you, right, like because you are the educational guru yeah. in the Senate. Thank you. What did you think about the school board elections? Um, uh, well, we had an increased turnout. That, there, that was one silver lining. Um, I think they, 
it was an interesting process to follow. I do love my processes. I thought it got a little messy. Um, you we'll know, get, school we'll get messy. Our, our school board elections that we just had, right? right? Um, Could you explain what's messy mean, Dale? For people who watch, everybody don't <laughs> not have... Not everybody inside. follows. Not everybody's... Well, everybody's not in, involved as you. Facebook, right? right? Uh-huh. Um, well, so I think there there was some tension around some some of, of what went on in, in that election um, in many ways. There's in multiple directions. Could you give us like two? Sure. So, um, so Red Clay... I was in the city of Wilmington, that was the only seat that was, or the only district that had seats that were up, had two seats that were up. Um, and there was just a little bit of, of drama in the 11th hour um, connected to the two open seats. Mm -hmm. There were uh, incumbents being challenged by some fresh faces. I think right. we had three fresh faces, right. two in one race, one in another. Um, and things got really heated around the issue of whether or not uh, we should have school resource officers. What do you think about that? Um, I I made public statements in in support of, of of revisiting whether or not we should have them. I think I think we need to look at putting more resources into mental health professionals, uh, social emotional supports, and things like so, that. So so you basically less. for getting rid of them. Uh, not overnight. You could you could say it right, or you want me to say it? Um, I mean, I think, I'm a, I'm a I think we should put less into law enforcement in our school buildings and more into so you want to get rid of them things. it's okay to say you want to get rid of them i don't think it's about a zero sum thing though i think it's like what is the balance that was what, what i spoke what do you to. think i just got a text message say the guy martin don't even live in the district what do you think about that um i i i mean if, i think we should investigate it i know he's made public statements on it in the past i mean i he has a residence i live in the same neighborhood uh of his, of his residence but do you ever see him no, but I mean, well, oh. <laughs> no. Oh, um, now the truth is coming out. But so I, I, but I think that the Department of Elections has a responsibility to to verify that sort of thing, and 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 if the public has information and evidence to the the contrary of what the Department of Elections has, that should be investigated. What do you think about referendums? Ah, oh boy, you're asking all the big ones. So they're that's probably That's why I get paid nothing. I love. <laughs> I wish I get paid the big bucks. And I like how it's like a rapid fire too. What do you think about referendums? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, Referenda, I think, is. A, I think they're tax. taxing the hell out of us. It's a tax that people have the opportunity to vote on. Who wants to vote in favor of taxing themselves? So people oftentimes use that opportunity to vote. Senator, no on a senator, tax. senator. Yes, sir. When they start threatening children. Start threatening yeah. athletics. Start threatening we're going to get rid of every teacher. Yeah. We're going to get rid of every principal. What is a person to say? Exactly. And How then, do you say then no? your taxes. So why don't the state legislator say every four years or three mm -hmm. years, two years, this is what we're going to do for school districts. Mm -hmm. So it won't even be an option. Well, so, and that's basically. Does that make sense? It, there is a bill on the table. Does that make sense? Yes, there's a bill on the table to do exactly that. So essentially to have it function the way vocational technical schools do, where the legislature approves that sort of increase that keeps the lights on, keeps you, you know, keeps you up with inflation and so on and so forth. So people would still have referenda when it comes to like, we want to build a new stadium. We're not just going to automatically jack up taxes to do something big like that. You go to the public for that. But in order just to keep up with, you know, the regular everyday expenditures and the way those increase, is it fair to make a school district go out and ask people for that? I don't think so, no. So I think that type of referenda, we really need to look at finding a better way. Matt, let's talk about the um, county administration. I mean, what county council. What's your relationship with the or to county council and county council president? Well, it's it's pretty good. I mean, there are thirteen people. Each has a different opinion. I have a different relationship. Yeah, with each explain one. to us how county government works. So it's a little bit like it's not that different than the city uh, or the state government or federal government. There's an executive branch. There's a legislative branch. Uh, the the county executive is the executive branch, and county council is a legislative branch. There are thirteen council people to pass most uh, ordinances. You need seven votes. Um, it's, I mostly can veto sore, it. it's mostly sore and so so in county government what we do is we do land use in unincorporated Newcastle County as I mentioned we're in charge of the paramedics the Newcastle County Police second largest police force we have 248 parks 15 public libraries parks wow. like Glasgow Park uh, Rockwood Park beautiful Sandy parks park. beautiful parks yeah <laughs> um, I think all parks are beautiful in their own way many of the parks actually most of those 248 are what we call parklets. They're little neighborhood parks. Yeah. They actually are, are obviously among our most used parks very often. But there's tremendous work keeping them up, making sure the grass is cut, making sure 
people for a while weren't going on the playgrounds and making sure they're safe. So, so pretty much have um, with COVID, is, have, you, have you had to lay anyone off? Is it? No, absolutely not. In fact, we've hired more. I said oh, from day one, wow. what we did, we made, we had uh, some really tough budget choices when I first came in. We were spending a lot more money than than we were taking in as revenue. Uh, we made some hard decisions, and as a result, our, our reserves have almost doubled. So as soon as COVID came, I said we're going to make sure that in partnership with the Delaware State Housing Authority, no one will get evicted in Newcastle County. Make sure we have money for that. We're going to make sure we're hiring more people throughout the process because I think that's the role of public governments when the economy's going down. We should be investing more in yeah. our people to, to, so that we're circulating money into our economy. Matt, I'm going to ask you a tough question because a few people... All questions you ask. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> a few people have asked me this. And, and actually, it's, it's probably flattering. A, num- uh, a number of people see you as running for governor. Um, and I, I, You don't have to answer it on here, but it would be probably nice to give me the inside scoop. <laughs> Um, just, just me and you talking just, now? Just me. No, <laughs> the 20,000 people are not watching. I think Tizzy can hear. Yeah. So, so have you given that thought? And do, do you hear it? I mean... I honestly... So you, you get you elected... You can't say you've never heard You it. get elected to something like... No, no, oh, no, no. We're not going to do the political... Yeah, we are. <laughs> you you want to join us? You want to There might I be children stuff. watching this. Oh. I said stuff. Or, no, or, it's about sewers. Yeah, you can, talk, you can yeah, say the word we're you, talking about sewers. Have you given it thought or have you had conversations? I really like being county executive. And I'm running for county executive this year. Would, would but, I, do I think about would I like to be governor? Are there things I'd like to do as governor? I think probably most people in the yeah, profession that, do. Right? That makes you think sense, about, right? Oh, if I was governor, how would I handle that? I think Governor Carney right now has we're, just we're, about the hardest job in the country. About, I think it's just about the hardest job. We're talking about you. Would you or have you been would, considered? Are there, are there scenarios have in you, the future you, where I possibly would yes. be governor? Yes. How about you? Would you be interested? No, I like my job. You would never <laughs> want to be governor. No. Never. No, I'd take if a I pay cut. You. What's that? I'm have to take a pay cut. Oh. Uh, so no. Wait, ask, hold on, man. I don't want to be governor. I want Norman's job. <laughs> now I'm ask you, Miss Lockman, right? Sure. How do you feel about diversity downstate in the Senate and House of Representatives? Do you think there's enough diversity amongst African Americans or people of color? In the Senate, in the House of Representatives. Um, I mean, we've made strides, of course, but um, no, uh, no, okay. of course not. I mean, that's one of the easier yes or no questions you've yeah, asked yeah, me. Right. I'm not a big but, on that black or white yes or no, but I, of course, there's not enough diversity. I think we need to see a lot more reflection of the fullness of the diversity we have as a state, and that's that's a black thing, but that's other things too. We have um, an incredible, you know, burgeoning Latino population in our state. We have we have an Asian population that we don't see reflected. The reason in why Delaware I asked you that question. The reason why I asked that question, man. Mm-hmm. I was a student at Delaware State in 1981, yeah. right? Yeah. And we had one state senator. That was Herman Holloway Senior mm-hmm. forever, right? Mm-hmm. We had two state representatives, right? That was Herman Holloway Junior and Al Plain. Yeah. Right, and. I had, Dar- it made me think, we had Darius Brown on last yeah. week, and he's like, this has been the most diverse it's ever been. I'm like, damn, is that it? Yeah. Like, we got 10 people, and that's eight. 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 And that's like, <laughs> that's really strides in 30, 40 years? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you understand my point? Absolutely. So that's why, I mean, like, sometimes we laugh and joke on here, but sometimes that's a serious issue because the neighborhoods have changed, mm-hmm. Right. I mean, you you see in the county government in four years. Sure. I mean, you got we got so many people who have migrated mm-hmm. from D.C., Philadelphia, New York, mm-hmm. have no idea the good, uh, the Delaware way. Well, so you mean the downstate seats specifically? You're talking yeah. about Kent County, Sussex County, not just. I mean, because I'm just saying, all overall. of our eight representatives uh, and senators right now who are black are we're all Newcastle County. Let us so. yeah. uh-huh. Um, and and uh, so we're we are we're seeing increasing diversity in other communities where that's not yet reflected in those Kent and Sussex County seats, maybe. So I think there's definitely room to see. Because, I mean, a person of color living in Sussex County is having a different experience than someone who's living in Newcastle. And we want to be able to represent, again, that fullness of diversity of experience and perspective that people well, have. I love shows. We have also, work to do. But also, I love shows like this. Suburban <laughs> Newcastle County has changed a lot in, has. Our, in our lifetime, right? Yeah. When I was a kid, for someone from what is now Mimi Brown and Kendra right. Johnson's right. district, there never would have been a person of color. Right. Like and so it's changing. And that's my point what I was trying and to get to. I, I yeah. hope that oh. we continue down that road to, to have, yeah. you know, as as you said, a st- state representatives who really reflect the community. So the state are. is what, 25% now minority? Probably uh, 20, 25%? Is that the total demographic? 
Twenty? You mean twenty five percent non white or twenty five percent black? I thought we were no, just non, just non white. Non white, I think it's higher. It's higher I think now. It's more like 30%. Yeah. So that's yeah, not, not reflective. And if no. that's the case, it's not reflective. Of it is not the state. Right. That's, no, it's not my, reflective. And, that, and that's my point. I mean, but also you, you got to look beyond that. And you you see it in jobs. Mm-hmm. You got to look at cabinet uh, level. You got to look that's at county point, government. Yeah. You, like, you got to look at county council. Everywhere. Well, that's why they talk about systemic racism, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. So it don't have to be uh, someone putting their knee on Floyd's neck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's somebody not getting that job when they should have got it. Or a judge yep. a judge overcharges some freaking body for taking a, a, a Twinkie. The black guy gets a felony mm-hmm. for thirty years, and the white guy gets a slap on the wrist. I yes. just saw. I just saw. I just saw. I just saw. The well, so much is driven in politics, you know, by necessity, by relationships, right? So if you have, but we would never have those relationships exactly. because you're not at the mm-hmm. at you're the not table. at the table. You're not at the table. You don't know someone at the table. If you don't know someone at the table, you're not at the table. I think somebody put it put it clear, right? Mm-hmm. They said this was a white guy, a friend of mine. He said we're. Vertical and horizontal, right? Mm-hmm. Vertically, our families, boom, then horizontal, we meet our friends in college, and boom, we all, and we don't have those opportunities no. or relationships. True, but more today than 20 years ago. You said something to me. Which is good, because I feel like at least, uh, it's not it's, perfect. You think it's, it's some imperfect. progress? I think it's, I think We've it's, made I mean, I feel like it's two steps forward, one step back, to be honest. You see that, like, the, the jump in the White House, and you're like, what is going on? Hey, man, what did, right? what did you, we had a little conversation about, um, the marches and, mm-hmm. and what, what was your thoughts on that? You know the Black uh, Black Lives Matter march, and I said something that I agree with the Black Lives Matter marches. But you had a great perspective, right? What did I say? Um, you said, "Well, <laughs> the kid getting shot in the neighborhood, right?" Because mm-hmm. I, I don't know how how you put it, mm-hmm. right? And I was like, "Well, yeah, but why would we put emphasis more on here than on there?" And you said something to the fact it wasn't negative, like. They've seen this happen a lot of times in a black community. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that conversation? No. <laughs> so do you you understand what I'm saying, though? No. What, 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 do, what do you think about the Black Lives Matter marches, right, as it relates to a young African-American, 15 or 14 or 13 or 10, getting shot by an African-American in the community? Do you think... Look, first of all, any, anyone getting hurt anywhere, anyone getting shot, any child getting shot is a horrific <laughs> tragedy, whoever pulled the trigger. I, I believe that when it's sort of state sponsored, when mm-hmm. it's there's a racial motivation, it is worse. Because it's about all of us. Mm-hmm. Um, of course it's worse. And, and, yeah, so I think I, I think it's worse. Generally about Black Lives Matter, I think it's a good thing. I think it's it's, it's a pushing great thing. us Pushing us forward the way 1960s civil rights. No, we waking you up here. Go I ahead. literally <laughs> raised my hand. Yeah, no, I agree with with that point. I think the difference. Of course, we want to rail against violence within the community as well as sort of from an external place. But I think that context matters. What creates it? What creates violence in the community? is also structural. It's also coming from deficits in education and, and access to jobs. A lot of stuff. All those kind, right? Yeah. It's heavy. It's not just. You know, it's it's we can't oversimplify that. And then when we're talking about what Black Lives Matter is about, um, talking about st- state sanctioned violence, it's like where is that coming from? That's also coming from systemic, you know, oppression and and those types of things. And then I think on top of that, the big difference is um, we often see consequences for that that violence in the community. That's in law. That's followed through on um, oftentimes, not always. But then what we don't always see when the law enforcement's involved in these types of things are consequences. And that comes back, I think, to, to the legislature in, in a lot of ways. And, and do we even have the mechanisms in place for someone to be prosecuted and held accountable for those actions? Right, right. And that is a huge difference. Right, right. Accountability for those, those behaviors is the difference. Let me ask you, ask you guys another quick question. I know I keep saying quick question. we got to leave. Um, <laughs> The president, you said something about the president. He's bringing in, um, he's calling himself law enforcement president now. He's bringing like National Guards oh. and communities. What do you guys think about that? Everything he does, I mean, it goes back to the first point I made. Almost everything he does has the intention of dividing our country. Almost it everything he divide. does. It's just, a, it's, it's creating an us and them, everything. Mm. That the people, my experience as a kid who was a protester, right? And seeing the people talking just today, I was talking to Kobe, like, 
they're not bad human beings. They're working for the good of the country. Absolutely. To be honest, just like a good number of police officers and elected officials are looking, working for the good of the country. And I think they need to be treated that way. That sometimes in our history, it's the only way to get things moving. And a lot of stuff that's happening now is going to be history. Would it's terrifying right now yeah. from my perspective. I love my country. I love democracy. And sometimes it seems like you know, the very top levels of government are working from, a, if this is a loaded word, but are working from a fascist playbook. I don't want to live in a country where that is permitted. Um, and I, I, I hope I hope we're able to turn the tide because it's it's scary and it's not the place that we want to be raising I, the kids. I, the system in so many ways is rigged, right? And I'm not one of these people who's always like, it's rigged. It's, I really think it's, ri it's rigged when you look at, at gerrymandering, right? Mm -hmm. The way they cut the districts when you look at campaign finance. Yeah. It's rigged against fundamental democratic principles. Mm -hmm. And I think we're gonna keep having this nonsense until we fix those mm -hmm. those wow. basic things. Mm -hmm. Wow. God, I wanna thank both of you. See, one is, you know, <laughs> we thought it was gonna take long. You know, once you get into it, right, you, even her, she woke you know up, then she started fighting. I'm like, oh, oh. Sissy, I was saying, you're the, you're the calm one. He was like, you like punch him. No. I was like, whoa, sister, relax. You know what I mean? Hey, ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've been enjoying. I, I, I love this show because people get a chance to talk with her. I mean, you open, great. right? Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Um, and I got to say one thing. Um, there was a lot of shuffling for people running for city government. Um, I like democracy, too. I think a person has a right. If that's mm -hmm. the rules, those are the rules. Mm -hmm. They didn't break any rules. Mm -hmm. People may didn't like it, but somebody created those rules, and they used the loopholes to do what they had to do. And I, I do believe, even if I'm against some people, I think they have a right to run. Absolutely. Because when I ran as a young man, I was told not to let this guy stay there. And I won. So every time a person calls and asks me, I say, it's up to you. Mm. I may disagree. Mm -hmm. I may give him mm -hmm. advice, but I think you have a right. You have the constitutional right. I don't, give a, I don't care if you run for president, treasurer, you know, governor, whatever, you have a right. And that's it. I mm -hmm. mean, and people call me up, man, did you see this person? I'm saying that person got a right. <laughs> so you would never hear me go against that. And I want to say one more thing. Um, there's another, talk about this Facebook madness. Leon Weiner and Associates own property on the east side. Mm -hmm. Compton. These guys are moving the people out, right? He, a private developer, and they're going to move them back in but they, they're, re, re, they're renovating all the units. Then something gets out, the mayor is going to gerrymander and kick everybody out of their house, give them a box. These freaking people are losing. I know what, it's either COVID or marijuana. They high, you're high. <laughs> I think you're just smoking weed, right? Which is okay, I used to smoke weed. <laughs> but you gotta calm down. You can't blame the mayor for every damn thing. He has nothing to do with that. Nothing to do with that. All right. Whew. That was fun. Is that cool? You're, yeah. Hey, look, look, look at Trevor. Come here, Trevor. Come say hi to everybody before we leave. Uh-oh. Come on, Trevor, come, come say hi. Come on, Come on, make, make a quick uh, a quick cameo. Yeah, I like that. I like and, that. And say bye, say bye, say bye. You can wave. All right, bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> bye. Thank you. All right, Ivan. See, I keep everybody off your butt every time, too. And that's a lot of butt to stay off of. <laughs> <laughs> I hope back there.